1 Corinthians 14. Let's read verse number 12. And the title of my message tonight, What Do I Come to Church For? <laughs> what do I come to church for? Uh, and this isn't negative, sarcastic, but really, what do I come to church for? And we'll answer that tonight, and uh, some, a lot of it will be familiar, I'm sure. But 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12. It's a great summary verse for the chapter. It says, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Father, I pray for your help as I preach tonight. Give me wisdom and discernment. And Lord, there's a lot of things I could push on um, that I think would be biblical and right, but I, I don't want to be distracted by lesser things than what you have for us tonight. And so, God, I pray that you'd guide me. Uh, may I be in spirit-filled, empowered preacher so that you can help our church be what it ought to be. Make this a helpful reminder of not just why we show up, but what we do when we get here and what you want to do in our lives. And help those that are watching at home and those that couldn't be here and speak to their hearts as well. Help the kids' class next door and my wife as she teaches. And help my children, each of our children tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many of the problems with churches could be fixed if we would simply return uh, to the great purpose that God has for us. A lot of times we, get dis- we start fussing with each other when we get distracted from the main purpose of our Christian life. Um, that's kind of what happened in the uh, church here in Corinth. The book of 1 Corinthians has the focus of restoring a church that allowed sin to get in and had forgotten what it was there for and what God wanted them to be doing. By the way, the Word of God has the answer to all of life's problems. Is that true? Yes, yes it is. The Word of God has the answer to all of life's problems. In first, we won't look at all of the chapters, but in 1 Corinthians, the, each, uh, in 1 Corinthians, the entire book is focused on fixing problems in churches. Um, I, I, a pastor friend of mine that supported us when we were in Ireland, he recommended that as soon as I get here to this church, I should preach through 1 Corinthians just to make sure I straighten out any problems. Didn't do that, but I guess, um, thankfully, most, I, as far as I can tell, the problems that existed in this church, or in 1 Corinthians, did not exist here, at least not that I saw. But, in, but for example, but in first, we won't read them, but in 1 Corinthians 1, there was, it shows there was division in the church, so the cure, he says, is, is to follow Christ. In chapter 3, uh, there's carnality and there's the self-life, so they're to look to the judgment seat of Christ. In chapter 5, um, there's sexual sin in its membership, so the goal is to uh, help them get right, and if not, to remove them and to separate from them. In chapter 6, they're suing one another So the answer, within the church, and that's not good. So the answer is to get somebody within the church um, that, that has a little bit of wisdom about them and let them decide, and for each side that's trying to sue one another, to be willing to suffer loss. It's amazing how that would fix a lot of problems if we would just say, let them have it, whatever, you know. Chapter number eight, there's weak Christians so in the, within the church. So to protect them, you do what you can to not create a greater stumbling block for them. In chapter nine, there's church leaders that are suffering financial hardship. So the result is to pay them, right? You do that here. I, I've been seeing on F- Facebook, makes me mad. But there's all the kind of articles and YouTube videos about how it's unbiblical for a church to pay its pastor. Read your Bible, and you'll find out that it's perfectly biblical. 1 Corinthians 9 deals with that. 1 Corinthians 11, there's ungodliness in the Lord's Supper. So there's the issue to remember the Lord Jesus Christ and to seek purity. And then chapter number 12, uh, there's self-exaltation, elevating self, regarding the spiritual gifts. So, the purpose is to remind them of their need for one another and to use their spiritual gifts for the entirety of the church, okay? But then we get to 1 Corinthians 13, which is all about love. You remember that one, 1 Corinthians love, 1 Corinthians love, 1 Corinthians 13, it's about, it's the charity chapter, it's the love chapter, and which is amazing. So, in the middle of two chapters that deal with how to treat people regarding your spiritual gifts, it deals with love. And then based on the foundation of love, a chari- the biblical word charity, of an agape giving love, with that as the foundation, then it moves to the issue of dealing with a church and dealing with spiritual gifts, specifically tongues, and helping one another. A lot of people take this chapter and they miss the point of tongues because the entire point was for the benefit of other people, not for yourself. In 1 Corinthians 14, um, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 13, let me just run through this quickly, and I can answer questions later, it ind- and I'm going to deal with the tongues chapter, 
and the rules for it for just a minute as well. But in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12, it tells us that tongues would cease. Some people hate that thought, but the Bible says it, that tongues would cease. And I believe it gives the time of that when that perfect, completed Word of God is come. So when the Word of God was finished and completed, then tongues would cease from usage. His, history says that from the, basically the second century till the late 1800s, n- no one that was connected to Christianity really spoke in tongues. Um, but regardless of history, matches or not, the Bible says it would end when the perfect Word of God is come. So any, that glass was finished. But regardless, in chapter, we won't go much into that, but chapter 14 deals with tongues while it's still in existence, while tongues was still in operation. So let's pretend that tongues is still in operation today. If you disagree that it ceased, well, let's pretend for a second that you're right and tongues still is in operation today. And the biblical tongues speaking, known, having the miraculous ability to speak known languages so people could understand. That's what tongues was. It was never gibberish. It was never just making up sounds. It was known languages and people understanding it. Let's pretend that that still existed today. And if it did, there are rules for it. For example, let me give you those. If you want to write them down, that would be helpful for another conversation. Um, But in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 27 to 28, it says that tongues must always be interpreted. So if God gave me the gift of tongues, um, I could miraculously speak Tagala. And if LV didn't understand Tagala, right? Okay, good. I'm not dumb. So, well, as dumb. So, she didn't speak any English. I didn't speak any Tagala. I started speaking, and God enabled me to speak that language, and she would understand. That would be biblical tongues. Biblically speaking, within a church, though, for the benefit of everybody else, it had to be interpreted or you're disobedient. (laughs) Um, Okay? So, we had to be interpreted. In verses 27, it says, uh, let it be by two or at the most by three. So, within a church service, how many people could speak in tongues? Two or three. Two or three, right? So um, there's that rule as well. Um, verse 32, um, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. It always had, which this ought to be a general rule anyways, it always had to match and be in line with the scriptures. So if it didn't match the scripture, it's wrong. <laughs> it wasn't from God. And this would, be, this would tear up a lot of people's feelings. But verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it's not permitted unto them to speak. Women were not allowed to speak in tongues. So the rule, which by the way, the context was for un- the purpose of tongues, according to that chapter, was for unbelieving Jews, always interpreted, two or three in a service, oh yeah, I forgot one, one at a time, and women couldn't do it. That would not fly in a modern charismatic church. If tongues existed today, and I don't believe it did, does, but if it did, if you don't follow the rules, it's not of God. So that's interesting. But anyways, in the chapter around tongues and prophecy, there's the divine instruction, though, for other things. And it deals with the reasons why that should be, why those rules are in place, some of them. But there's overarching principles that should always be present when we gather together as a church family and a church service. There's one summarizing statement about our attitude about when you co- and your behavior when you come to church. We read this as our text in verse 12. So when you come to church, this ought to be part of your, your desire, your purpose for showing up. Even so ye, for as much as you're zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Your goal as a whole ought to be to benefit your church family. In this, t- in this chapter, though, I'm going to give you four things what you come to church for. And with, there can be a sum, that summarizing statement kind of covers all of it, but we'll deal with that issue of edification more specifically. And it, I, I love alliterated messages, you know that by now, but it worked out perfectly. So number one, I'm going to give you a, number one purpose, which you come to church for, is equipping. Number one, equipping. Look in verse number three. By the way, read the whole chapter in your own free time. Make sure I'm not making up stuff. But we won't have time to go through the whole chapter. Verse 3, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. The chapter begins with Paul emphasizing that prophecy is better than tongues. Prophecy is better than tongues. That's, uh, that's one great idea that he gives. So tongues is, was the giving of language. Prophecy in the Bible times and the general understanding, prophecy proper, 
a prophet proper, is declaring new information from God, usually future, but it's just getting new information from God and telling it for, for other people. Uh, generically speaking, not uh, prophecy can just be giving the Word of God. So technically, we could say, not in the proper sense of the term, what I'm doing right now is prophesying. I'm saying this is what God said. Prophecy is telling you what God has said, There's, but a term that we use, generally speaking, because I'm not getting new information is Preaching. So pre- we could use that term those t- almost synonymously. So he says, when one, when, but he that prophesieth or declares the word of God, they speak unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So here Paul tells us that preaching takes place within the church, and when it does, it should be for edifying, exhorting, and comforting. Again, we'll do edification in the next point, so that'll be your second one, but edification means to build up. We're not quite there yet, building up. Exhortation means imploring or begging, You not just saying, this is what the Bible says, that's kind of teaching, um, but imploring or exhortation is you need to do this. It's a whole lot more specific. There, there's more to declaring the Word of God. I have more of a job than just to teach you the Word of God, but I need to preach to you the Word of God and say, this is what God says. You need to be doing this or you're not right with God. You need to do this so God can bless you. You need to do this so you can live a happy, joyous life. Right? That's what preaching is. It's more practical and to the point, you need to do this. Um, uh, edification is building you up. We could say exhortation is straightening you up. <laughs> right? That, that seems a little bit harder, but that's what the Word has to do with. And then comfort. I think we get that one. This is the truth about God and your life, and this will help you. Why do we come to church? Because we need to hear what the Word of God says. We need the preaching of the Word of God. We need to be equipped for life, to live for God. We come to have our life compared to the Word of God. It can be done in the right spirit, of course, but this is what the Bible says. And if you don't do what the Bible says, you need to fix that. That's what preaching does. So that's what the prophesying here, prophesying had to do with in part. But preaching shows you how to be saved, how to be good, a good man, how to be a good woman, how to live a godly life, how to have a good marriage, how to, have be, how to be a good parent, how to deal with your finances properly, how to treat people, how to speak to people, how to share your faith, how to be ready to meet God, and so much more. There's the practical side of it. Of course, there's doctrinal truth of this is right, and this is what the Bible says, but, this is, but preaching is also this is what it says, and this is what you do with it. Let's turn, we'll come right back to 1 Corinthians 14. But in 2 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4, Paul tells Timothy, uh, reminding him of the importance of preaching the Word of God. Or 2 Timothy, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 4. Verse number 1, I charge thee therefore... Before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, repu- I'm sorry, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables." We need the preaching of the Word of God, even in a time which uh, so unwisely said, he says, there will come a time when they will, uh, for there will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. We're in that time today. People more and more don't want to hear the Word of God. And I I never noticed this before, um, thinking about somebody. It says, for the time will come when when they will not endure sound doctrine. So they don't want to hear the sound teaching and preaching. He tells them to preach. The sound teaching and preaching of the Word of God. So after their own lust, their own desires, just what they want in their life, they'll leave the preaching and they'll desire teachers. Look, the teaching's okay. I just don't want confrontation. I don't want people to point their finger at me and telling, telling me I'm in sin. That's what people do. And what will be the result of saying, I'm going to find something that matches my desires more. I'm going to leave the, the preaching and just go for teaching because it makes my ears feel good. What will they do? They shall turn away their ears from the truth. That's a sad thought. No, I, I, I still want the Bible. I just don't want to be confronted. What will they do? They will turn away from the truth. They're supposedly seeking truth, but they're not. Hi, Brother Ken, gotcha. So anyways, uh, they should turn away, turn away their ears from the truth and should be turned unto fables, fake fairy tales. Is that happening today? Yes, it is. We need the preaching of the Word of God. Sometimes you need to be told, obviously, 
in a kind, compassionate spirit. He says to reprove, to rebuke, and exhort, all with long-suffering and doctrine. I should reprove you if I'm biblical. I should rebuke you if I'm biblical. I should exhort you, build you up, straighten you up. If I'm biblical, how? With long-suffering and doctrine. Why? Because we need that. Sometimes we need to be told. We need to fix some things. Yes, we need the teaching of the Word of God. We need doctrine. We need the foundation laid. But sometimes we need confrontational approach, preaching of the Word of God. God understood that. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. The preaching of God's Word gives us comfort and hope to know that God cares, to know that God is working on you, to know that when you've sinned and when you've blown it and when you're confronted about it, that there's always forgiveness. The preaching of the Word of God tells you, yes, you're a sinner, and yes, you need to be saved, but God will save you. Preaching does that. Yes, it re- reveals to us uh, what the Bible says. God has chosen by the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. God's chosen to use that because it not only uh, tells us the truth, but it confronts us personally, and it tells us about God and how we can be saved and forgiven and made right with God. But why do you come to church? You come to church to be better equipped to live the Christian life. Yes, sometimes that's teaching, but sometimes it's preaching and confrontation. Sometimes that's from the pulpit. Sometimes it's conversationally. Sometimes, Pastor, I've got a question. I I believe God wants me to do this, and then I get to say God doesn't want you to do that because the Bible says otherwise. Sometimes that hurts, and we don't like that, but sometimes we need that because God wants to help us live a better life to glorify Him with, so we need that equipping. And what, what do we come to church for? For that equipping. Number two, verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 14. Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. We come to church for equipping. Number two, we come to church for edifying. I think, well, we already saw that. What's the difference? Not edifying for us, but for others. For even so ye, for as much as you're zealous of spiritual gifts, you're excited about the gifts that God has given you. Every Christian has a spiritual gift, something that God wants them to use for the benefit of the, the, the body of Christ of their church. So with that gift, seek that ye, all of you, may excel to the edifying of your church, of the church. So when you come, you come to be equipped. You personally to be edified and exhorted and comforted. But you come for the benefit, for the building up of others. Look in verse number 3 of your Bible in chapter 14. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification. Follow along with me. Verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Remember, chapter 13 is all about others, loving others. So that's a, that's a condemnation. You're aimed at yourself. But he that prophesieth, what? Edifieth the church. So it's about building up other people. Verse 5, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Verse 12, we've read multiple times. Verse 26, let's read the last sentence of verse 26. There, Let all things be done unto... I think there's, there's a hint here of a recurring theme. The whole purpose for us showing up, well, part of one of the purposes, one main purpose of us showing up is to build up, to strengthen our church body, and we do that by building up and strengthening one another. This is where the Corinthian church messed up. (laughs) And the point of this chapter deals with their issue of tongues, and we can apply that to the modern tongues movement as well. The point of church is not just for you. The point of showing up to church is not another E word, is not entertainment. The point of church is not for you to get some fuzzy feeling. Yes, you come to be strengthened yourself, but you come to edify one another, and we must do both. Edification, edifying, 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 edifying. We keep finding it in the text. This, I, I tend to poke you, especially on Sunday mornings with double the crowd here. Uh, Hebrews 10, 20, uh, 24, 25, um, a constant reminder of what we're supposed to be and being in the house of God. In about five weeks, I'm going to preach on this subject as well. Again, so on a Sunday morning, but Hebrews 10, 24 
And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. He says you ought to go to church, and when you do, you do it to build up, to exhort. Both faithful attendance and exhortation are commanded by God. You be faithful to church and not just to show up and warm a pew and get something from it, but you're, you're equally as commanded to be faithful and also when you're there to build up one another. Do both. How can I build up my church? There's lots of ways we can come up with for time. I won't ask because it'll probably drag on. Um, how can I build up some church? I wrote a few ideas down by bringing new people. The lost to be saved, new Christians. Sometimes people are looking for a new church. By praying for one another, with them, praying with one another, and praying for one another. They may not know it. Letting people know you're praying for them and actually be praying for them. (laughs) By being an encouragement to other people. Sometimes people are hurting, and you don't know that. Sometimes you just encourage them. And many you, you folks have no idea how many times you've encouraged me when I really needed it, and you didn't know it. You're doing your job, and it's not just me. And I know you're an encouragement to others in our church. By keeping up with one another, checking on them, visiting them, you do that. By fellowshipping with one another here and outside of here. By fight, by faithful financial investment in your church that builds us up. By serving one another, by serving in a ministry of this church, that's what you use your spiritual gifts for. But we ought to be a faithful tender, a tender, but we ought to be building up. You ought to, by the way, not just be a faithful tender, but a member of a church and connect to that church, be accountable to that church, and serve in it. You got to encourage one another and build them up that way. You got to do more than and you got to do more than just show up late and run out the door as soon as the last day men is said. You can't you can't encourage and edify one another if you just come for you and run out the door. I understand we just got through COVID and everyone was supposed to do that for a year, but right. But we're here not just for ourselves to be equipped, but to edify one another. Number three, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. Equipping, edifying, exalting. Exalting. Verse 15 says, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen? Amen. At thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. So far, church has been about ourselves. You get something for yourself and give something to other people. As a church, we're to strengthen the church, but that's not all. You don't just come for you. You come to exalt the Lord. What is it then? I will pray. Pray to who? You're not praying to me. You're not praying to each other. You know, sometimes when, uh, when someone leads in prayer, we feel like we're praying to other people, trying to say something to encourage them, but really it ought not be necessarily that way. We're praying to the Lord. I will pray with a spirit, with the lowercase spirit, the, inner, uh, the spirit living within me, uh, my spirit, with my, with my being, in communicating with God, with my spirit. And I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with a spirit, so with all of me, with my being inside of me, I will pray with a spirit, so I communicate with God, and with the understanding also. By the way, spirit ain't in truth. Uh, that's a good connection. Else, when thou bless with the Spirit, when you praise God, when you glorify God, praying, singing, and blessing, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks? So there are three things that are present here in exaltation. I need to go faster without being un- understandable um, by talking too fast. But there are three things present in exaltation. There's prayer to God, there's singing for God, and there's blessing to God. Prayer to God, that's talking to God about our needs. There's singing to God, using music to lift up and praise God. And there's a blessing of God that's praising God with our words, not necessarily singing. By the way, I thought this was interesting. I never noticed this before in my life. Um, I'm slow. You may have noticed it a long time ago. There's something that's understood that happens. And, and some of us are good at this. And, but anyways, it, sometimes it's, you're not used to this kind of culture. But there's a biblical culture here. Uh, there's something that is understood that it takes place in a church service. Else, look in verse 16. <coughs> Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, 
So when someone is praising God, the Lord's good. Thank the Lord for, for saving my soul. When, there, when, when else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks? What is understood? What, what is understood? I don't want to say this. What is normally taking place when someone blesses and praises God? What do people say? Yeah. Right, you got it. That's not just Southern culture. That's not just crazy church culture. That's Bible. I'd never seen that before. I've heard preachers say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That's in the Psalms. And that's a good verse about saying amen. In, in Nehemiah chapter number 8, verse 6, and, all the, uh, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered amen with, uh, with lifting up of hands. And their heads bowed, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their face to the ground. So, there's, so it's amening when there's something good and something you can agree with. Amen says, let it, let it be so. You, you agree with it. That's biblical, by the way. Some people get really nervous about this one. In Nehemiah, with lifting up of hands, 1 Timothy 2 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. If God impresses on your heart, it ain't for show, it ain't dancing, but if God impresses on your heart to say amen, go for it. It's biblical. You've got God's permission. Amen. Yeah, there you are. So, anyways, it's there. We come to church to worship the Lord, though. It ain't about show. If it becomes, if it becomes chaos, we go against the end of the chapter decently in order. If it becomes for show, then we go against the Word of God and it's for pride's sake. But when it's genuine, thanking the Lord, praising the Lord, blessing the Lord, praise God for it, and if people think less of you, then they're wrong. <laughs> but we come to worship the Lord through preaching and prayer and praise. We look to God. We draw close to God. Church is not just about ourselves. It's about us and God. and It's about the Lord. It's not about this is not another classroom. It's not just empty education. It's an opportunity for you to communicate with God. That's part of the purpose of an invitation, an altar call, whatever you want to call it. You respond to God. By the way, you don't have to come down here to do that, but sometimes there's been many times God deals with my heart in a service and just right there where I am, I bow my head and pray and have to, Lord, have, have to ask God to forgive me because I don't want to wait another 20 minutes until the message is over, right? For me, it could be longer. But if God speaks to you, communicate with God. It's about pleasing the Lord. And by the way, the result of a church service should be you leaving this place and exalting the Lord more because you've gotten right, because you've learned how to obey Him in another way. Doesn't this make sense? What do we come to church for? To pray to, uh, to, pray to Him, to sing, and to bless Him? while we're being equipping and exalting one another. And lastly, there's one more thing. Look in verse 23. There's, I'm sure there's more in this chapter than what I'm looking at, but these four things the Lord showed me. Verse 23, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place. That would be a wonderful thing if every member of Grace Baptist Church showed up at the same service. Man, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and they're coming those that are unlearned or unbelievers. So maybe saved people that don't know or unbelievers, lost people. Will they not say that they are mad? But if all prophesy, so if, if someone, if the preaching of the word of God goes, and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Equipping, edifying, exalting, evangelizing. Evangelizing. What's the point that we just read dealing with the issue of tongues? What if everyone in the room is speaking in tongues contrary to the rules? They walk in, they think, this is craziness. Understood. Or even if it was done biblically, I don't, I don't understand what they're saying. So the issue was the benefit of the preaching of the Word of God is that people can understand. So what happens? Someone that is, un, there's a process here. There's a five-step process. First, there's, um, or it's the same person, but they become somebody different. There's unlearned or unbelieving people. Verse 23, unlearned or unbelievers. And then in verse number 24, but if all prophesy... And there come in one that believeth not or unlearned. So the unlearned hears. So the unlearned or unbelieving person becomes a hearing person to the preaching of the word of God. And then he is convinced of all. 
An unbelieving person becomes a hearing person, becomes a convinced person. They hear the word of God. You know, you know that's true. I am a sinner. I am guilty. Okay, I do believe now that Christ loves me and died for me. I'm convinced that Jesus rose again. I'm convinced that he could save me. What, he's convinced of all. He's judged of all. The word of God confronts his life. He judges himself. Yes, I'm a sinner. And he's in, convin in being convinced, he believes on the Lord. And then what is the result of this unbelieving person becoming a hearing person, becoming a convinced person? Verse 25, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God. That person becomes a worshiping person. Isn't that what we want? Oh, by the way, let me, excuse me, there's one more. Falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. He'll go out of this place and, you know, God saved my soul there at that church. I didn't believe it, but God and his word convinced me. He saved my soul, and now I'm a worshiper of Christ. Let me tell you about Christ. He becomes one that reports what Christ has done. I want lost people to come to this church. We ought to always want lost people coming in here. And yes, Grace Baptist Church, it is a body of believers that have joined together through baptism or, or by baptism, whether it's here at another church, you've been baptized and you join this church. This, we, have a, we have a church membership here. And so this is a meeting of Grace Baptist Church. But I want visitors to come. I want lost people to come. Why? So that those unlearned or unbelieving, maybe not yet, but, but generally speaking, lost people, those unlearned or unbelieving people can be hearing and then convinced and then worshiping and then reporting what God has done. By the way, that's what you are. At once, once upon a time, you were an unlearned, unbelieving person who heard and then was convinced, and now you're a worshiper, and you ought to be a reporter of what Christ has done. We ought to be evangelizing. And by the way, we ought to go ye therefore and teach all nations. We ought to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we must do this outside of these walls, but it definitely ought to take place in this, in this place too, here and out there. I quoted this verse kind of, I think, 1 Corinthians one twenty one. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. People will come and hear evangelistic preaching, be convinced by the Holy Spirit of their need and God's ability to save, and they will believe and they will become worshipers and witnesses for Christ. We come to evangelize. And by the way, it's not just me. How many of you teach a Sunday school class? Did you raise your hand? I know Paul's out, it went somewhere. Right. And by the way, even if you teach a junior church class or help out with a junior church class or, or in the nursery with the little ones and you teach a Bible lesson, and sing Bible songs and things like that, or you help out with a vacation Bible school, or you, ha or you have been a personal worker, you know, I give an invitation. Okay, so I, I say on Sunday mornings usually, you know, if you never trusted Christ, you know, once you come and someone can take a Bible and show you how you can be saved, some of you would be that kind of worker that would take them to the back and lead them to Christ. You become one of those preachers. But sometimes it's, you know, you, bring a friend, you ever brought a friend to church and, or you invited somebody and they showed up, so the right thing to do is to sit with them, right, so they're not all lonely, you know, and then you can see how they're, you can't, uh, and then they're not, you can see them squirm during the preaching. You ever seen that? You can tell they're uncomfortable. Not because they want to get out of here, but we're, it seems like God's working. And you can tell by how they dance there in the pew. They, they want to go to the altar, but they won't. It would be amazing if someone would just say, hey, can I go pray with you? Or you ever see somebody that has never been here before? You can't tell by how they look, but you, they go to the altar and you think, that's kind of weird, I don't know who they are. It would be a good idea for you to go pray with them. Hey, can I pray with you? Amen. By the way, do you know Christ is your Savior? You're doing the evangelizing. Yeah, you ought to hand out tracts and invite people. But God wants to use you here in this place to reach people. It's not just me. Sometimes, you know, especially on Sunday nights or Wednesdays, I say amen and people run out the door. You may want to catch them. Hey, what would you think of the service? You know, Eam hands out the, the, the gift bags with the done books. She's evangelizing. Get people, talk to people, encourage people. Ask, you know, you don't have to be annoying, but ask people, what would you think, you know? Did you think about the message? Do you know Christ? Get a hold of people, invite them out for dinner. <laughs> Do something to evangelize people that come. But why should you come to church? to be equipped, because we need the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. We need to be built up and strengthened to be straightened out sometimes and comforted. 
Why do you come to church? Not only to be equipped, but to edify. Because each of you need an encourager. You need someone else to build you up. So once you build up somebody else, God will bless you for that. Think about others. That was one of the problems this church had, the Corinthian church. What are you here for? To exalt the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To pray to Him. To sing to Him. To bless Him. To praise Him. To glorify Him. To respond to Him, by the way, when He speaks to your heart. What are you here for? To evangelize.